let's actually get down to business now and listen to some scenes from one of the episodes, okay? Now, the scenes I'm going to play you are all on YouTube, and these are, these scenes actually come from an episode called Gordon Ramsay's Great British Nightmares, which was shown on TV between Series 5 and Series 6 of Kitchen Nightmares. It's basically the same as any other episode of Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen Nightmares. Uh, and in this, this one is called Gordon Ramsay's Great British Nightmare Dovecoat Bistro. And in this one, Gordon goes to visit a restaurant in Devon called uh, Dovecote Bistro. Devon is in the southwest of England. Uh, he goes to this place called Dovecote Bistro, which is run by a guy called Mick. Okay. Now, let me just tell you a couple of... Let me give you a brief summary of the episode first so you get some context, which will help you to understand the little scenes that we're going to listen to. Okay. So Mick is the guy who runs the bistro, and he's a former truck driver and burger van operator. A burger van, that's like a, you know, a van. Van is an English word for a kind of a utility vehicle, you know, like a, uh, a car with a large area of storage on the back. So you could use it to, if you're transporting loads of furniture, you need to get a van, okay? A van, the, the next, in America, they'd say a truck. Um, okay, a van, all right. So uh, Mick used to run a burger van, a burger van, These are it's a van that has a window in the side and he cooks burgers in the van and sells them through the window. That's what he used to do. Okay, not usually the um, cream of the cream in terms of, uh, you know, uh, cooking, is it really a burger van? But anyway, that's what he used to do. And he's he's since then, he's opened a bistro, which is like a, you know, a restaurant, basically, with his wife and his adopted daughter. So it's Mick, his wife, and his adopted daughter running this bistro. His daughter's called Michelle, adopted. Now, let's listen to the first scene. And here we're going to, to hear... Um, let's see, let me just find the right uh, one. So this is where Gordon first arrives in the restaurant... And he sits down, He first he comments on the, the, the decor of the restaurant, then he sits down to try the famous lamb shank, and let's hear what he thinks about it. So as you're listening to this, I'd like you to just try to notice, so this is just about three minutes. I might pause it in the middle, but what I want you to notice is um, what does he think of the food, and what does uh, Michelle, the daughter, what does she say about the way the food is prepared? Okay, and the other thing is, of course, Watch out for the swearing, okay? Uh, so if you don't like swearing, then just sort of like brace yourself. And if you do like swearing, then just, you know, try to notice the ways in which Gordon Ramsay swears because he is one of the best in Britain at swearing. Okay, here we go. Let's see what this ex-trucker can do. An eating experience you must try. The steaks, local produce, chicken dishes, duck, lamb shanks, all lovely. All food is freshly cooked. Hello. Hello, Michelle. Michelle, nice to see you. And pleasure to meet you. Your blouse matches the wallpaper. I feel like I'm tripping out. Never touched the stuff, but I feel like I've just swallowed an <laughs> E. Holy crap. Compared to the hideous wallpaper, the menu's very attractive. Simple, freshly cooked food. On paper, it looks delicious. Orange squash. Spoonful of uh, gravy. Rich and meaty, it's called. Plain, a lot of them say it's the best they've had, so... It can't be that bad, can it? First up, mix house special. Duck with orange sauce. Excellent. Oh la la. Hey, there's the potatoes. Just Jesus Christ. For you. Fuck me, do I need sunglasses? <laughs> what is that sauce? I think maybe it's the orange squash he uses. Did you really say orange squash? It looks like someone's dropped a fucking lemon tart on my plate. Gives it colour. Ah, uh, fuck me. Jesus Christ, that's worse than fucking Benelin. Next up is the lamb shank. Ooh, I love lamb shanks. Fucking hell. OK, there wow. you are. Excellent, thank you. Are this local lamb? They're, they're actually vacuum-packed ones. Uh, actually, they can last for about a year. Just say that again? They're, they're bought in, they're vacuum-packed, the lamb shanks, and they've actually got a life shelf of about a year and they don't have to be kept refrigerated. Holy fuck. Yeah. Hold on a minute. So that. where has that been hanging around? It's just in a box. They're kept in a box. In a hot kitchen? Yeah, I've, I've got to tell the truth. I can't I lie know, to I you. I know, I respect your honesty. <laughs> well, fuck me. And on the box. That's a first for me. I'm not even going to taste it. That's fine. Up. 
Oh, shit. That might just be the worst food I've ever come across. That might just be the worst food I've ever come across. Okay, uh, so he doesn't like it then. I think that's obvious, isn't it? Um, okay, let's let's go through that again, and I'm going to pause it and just explain things bit by bit. So the first thing is he arrives at the uh, restaurant, he has a look at the menu, and then he comes in and he comments on the decor, and then he sits down. Let's see what this ex-trucker can do. Let's see what this ex-trucker can do. So he's an ex-trucker, because we know they used to work in a truck, right? An ex-trucker, former trucker. Let's see what this ex-trucker can do. An eating experience you must try. The steaks, local produce, chicken dishes, duck, lamb, shanks. Oh, lovely. All food is freshly cooked. All food is freshly cooked, it says on the menu. Freshly cooked, really, okay. Um, so he seems to like the menu, because, you know, the menu's fairly simple and it's got some ingredients that he thinks look good. So anyway, he's quite impressed by that. Now, as he walks into the restaurant, what does he say? So imagine him walking in and he's looking around. What's the first thing he says? And it's a swear word. Fuck me. Did you get that? Did you catch that? He just walks in. He's like literally walking in, having a look at the wallpaper. Fuck me. He walks in, he goes, fuck me. So there's a swear word for you. There's a swear word. Fuck me. Okay, now fuck me. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, and it doesn't it doesn't mean he actually wants someone to, to you know he doesn't want, he's not interested in uh, yeah, I think you know what I mean he's not trying to shag someone uh, fuck me is a way of saying oh my god okay oh my god fuck me look at that okay so fuck me is a way of sort of expressing surprise or shock okay like fuck me it's hot isn't it okay and and it's not always negative. It can be positive. Fuck me, that was delicious. Okay? So fuck me is a way of saying surprise. It's like a way of expressing surprise or shock. And that's the first thing that he says as he walks in because he's he takes a look at the, the wallpaper and he's like, fuck me. And he sort of says it under his breath. Fuck me. Hello. Hello. And then he sees Michelle. Hello, hello. And how do they greet each other? Michelle. Michelle, nice to see you. And pleasure to meet you. You're nice to see you. Yeah, and pleasure to meet you. Nice to see you. Pleasure to meet you. House matches the wallpaper. Your blouse matches the wallpaper. Very charming, Gordon. Hello. Hello, Michelle. Michelle, nice to see you. And pleasure to meet you. Your blouse matches the wallpaper. I feel like I'm tripping out. Your blouse matches the wallpaper because her blouse is kind of like black and white striped and so is the wallpaper. And he, and he says, I feel like I'm tripping out. If you're tripping out... It means that you are. Um, it, it means that you've like taken some drugs or something, and you're hallucinating or something like that. Uh, I feel like I'm tripping out because the the wallpaper is so dazzling and and psychedelic. I feel like I'm tripping out. And then he says, "What? Um, I've never taken one, but I feel like I've just had an E. I've never taken the stuff. I've never touched the stuff, but I feel like I've just had an E." So he's saying, "I've never tried ecstasy." But I feel like I've just had an E. I feel like I've just taken some ecstasy because of the wallpaper. Very funny, Gordon. Ciao, nice to see you. And pleasure to meet you. Your blouse matches the wallpaper. I feel like I'm tripping out. Never touched the stuff, but I feel like I've just swallowed an E. <laughs> I feel like I've just swallowed an E. Okay, fine. Crap. Com Holy crap, he says. Holy crap, which is another way of stating surprise. Just swallowed an E. <laughs> Holy crap. Compared to the hideous wallpaper, the menu's very attractive. Compared to the hideous wallpaper. Hideous. Uh, hideous, all right? There's another one. Um, hideous means disgusting, really ugly. Compared to the hideous wallpaper, the menu's very attractive. Menu's very attractive. Simple, freshly cooked food. On paper, it looks delicious. On paper, it looks delicious. So you got on paper, which is a bit like saying in theory. Okay, on paper or in theory. Um, so you got on paper and then in practice. Okay, see what I mean? So on paper, meaning like if when you see it written down on the menu, it looks delicious. But in practice, when you actually taste it, it's not. So on paper or in theory, you know, um, on paper, the business plan looks great. Let's see if it actually works. So on paper and in in. On paper, in theory, and in practice. Um, okay, so uh, on paper, it looks delicious. It looks delicious. Now we see a um, video of um, 
of Mick uh, cooking with his orange squash, which is not pretty. And Gordon can't see this because he's sitting in the restaurant. Orange squash. Spoonful of uh, gravy. Orange squash. This is Mick. Orange squash. Spoonful of gravy. So he's poured a bunch of orange squash into a frying pan and he's pouring a spoonful of gravy. Gravy is a kind of meat sauce, basically. Rich and meaty, it's called. Play. A lot of them say it's the best they've had. A lot of them say it's the best they've had. A lot of them say it's the best they've had. So it can't be that bad. <laughs> a lot of them say it's the best they've had, so it can't be that bad. Mick is convinced that this is a delicious um, uh, recipe. Play. A lot of them say it's the best they've had. So it can't be that bad, can it? First up, Mick's house special. Duck with orange sauce. This is the house special duck with orange sauce, and this is the sauce made from orange squash, and it's a bright orange colour. Excellent. Oh la la. Oh la la, says Gordon, which is a French expression, meaning, you know, another expression for surprise. So we've had, uh, fuck me, and we've had, holy crap, and now, oh la la, which is, you know, it's not strictly English. I think Gordon picked it up from French chefs he's worked with, probably. Yeah, there's the potatoes. Just Jesus Christ. For you. Jesus Christ. There's another rude one. Another expression of surprise, because of the way it looks. I mean, it looks like it's radioactive, for goodness sake. Fuck me, do I need sunglasses? Fuck me, do I need sunglasses? <laughs> what is that sauce? Uh-huh. Maybe it's the orange squash he uses. Did you really say orange squash? It looks like someone's dropped a fucking lemon tart on my plate. Looks like someone's dropped a fucking lemon tart on my plate. Okay. Uh, notice the way he says fucking, not fucking. So which is a slight difference in his accent, which suggests that he's not from London. He's from somewhere further north. Looks like someone's dropped a fucking lemon tart on my plate. Um, okay, it looks like someone's dropped a fucking lemon tart on my plate. A lemon tart, you know, it's a pie. It's like a sweet pie made from lemons and it's usually bright yellow colour. Looks like someone's dropped a fucking lemon tart on my plate. He's now tasting it. Gives it colour. Uh. And he can't eat it. He's he's put it back onto the fork because he can't eat it because it's too disgusting. Mate. Jesus Christ, that's worse than fucking Benelin. Next up. That's worse than fucking Benelin. <laughs> uh, Benelin is a medicine that you would take if you've got a sore throat. Okay, imagine you've got a sore throat. <coughs> I've got a bit of a sore throat. Take some Benelin. And it's like, you know, a bottle of medicine and you pour it onto a white spoon and... <laughs> It tastes disgusting, but it helps your throat. That's Benelin. And, you know, that kind of medicine is usually bright coloured as well and tastes horrible. And apparently this is worse than Benelin. So that's worse than fucking Benelin. Next up is the lamb shank. Oh, I love lamb shanks. Next, the lamb shank. Fucking hell. OK, there well, you are. Excellent, thank you. This is local lamb. They're, they're actually vacuum packed. What right, so this is where, the, where he realises that it's not local fresh lamb. And she admits openly that it's vacuum-packed lamb, which is like cooked already somewhere else and then vacuum-packed and then is stored in the kitchen in a box. Just stored in a box on the floor in the kitchen, in a hot kitchen. Cool lamb. They're, they're actually vacuum-packed ones. Uh, actually, they can last for about a year. They can last for about a year. So there's the word last, meaning they can continue. Uh, they can last for a year, okay? Last. Nice nice word, uh, nice verb, meaning to, you know, used to describe how long something continues. For example, the film lasts 100 minutes. The flight lasts eight hours, okay? You know, I took some paracetamol and it, you know, it, it lasts for four hours, Okay, so uh, the food lasts for how long? 12 months or something. There's local lamb. They're, they're actually vacuum packed ones. Uh, actually, they can last for about a year. They can last for about a year? Oh, imagine having pre cooked meat stored in a box in the kitchen for a year. Oh, that's not right. It's got to be full of chemicals. Just say that again. They're, they're bought in, they're vacuum packed, the lamb shanks, and they. Passive voice. You notice the grammar here. They are bought in so mick buys them in okay they are bought in they are vacuum packed so passive voice mick buys them in the factory vacuum packs them they're vacuum packed the lamb shanks and they've actually got a life shelf of about a year and they don't have to be kept refrigerated 
They have a life shelf of a year and they don't have to be kept refrigerated. Uh, they have a life shelf. Now, Michelle gets that wrong, probably because she's a bit nervous because she's speaking to Gordon Ramsay. It's not life shelf, it's shelf life. They have a shelf life of about a year. If food or products have a shelf life, it means that that's how long they last, okay? So, for example, in this case, these lamb shanks have a shelf life of a year. A shelf is where you store things, right? You have shelves in uh, your kitchen, and you've got shelves at the top and shelves at the bottom, you know, like these places where you can store things. So, a shelf life, that means they can stay on the shelf for a year, um, in this case. They don't have to be kept refrigerated. Holy fuck. Holy fuck. So we've had holy crap, uh, holy sh holy fuck, fuck me, Jesus Christ, and oh la la as well. Yeah. Hold on a minute. Don't so where that. has that been hanging around? So where has that been hanging around? Where's that been hanging around? Meaning where's that been waiting? Where's that been just sort of spending its time? Hanging around. I think you know the expression. What did you do last night? Oh, nothing. We were just hanging around in the park, playing football, just spending time in a place. So where's that been hanging around? Meaning where's the food just been vaguely kept, not in a specific place? Where's that been hanging around? And I think she says it's, it's been hanging around in a box. Hold on a minute. Don't so where has that been hanging around? It's just in a box. They're kept in a box. In a hot kitchen? Yeah, I've, I've got to tell the truth. I can't I lie know, to I you. I know, I respect your honesty. <laughs> well, fuck me. And on the box. That's a first for me. I'm not even going to taste it. That's fine. Up. That's a first for me. I'm not even going to taste it. That's a first meaning that's the first time that he's noted, he's ever experienced that. That's a first for me. It's the first time he's be, ever been served uh, lamb that's been uh, kept on the uh, on the kitchen floor like that. Um, all right. Okay, let's carry on. Oh, shit. That might just be the worst food I've ever come across. That might just be the worst food I, I've ever come across. There's a phrasal verb. To come across something. To come across something means to just sort of discover it by accident. So let's say you're just walking along the street, minding your own business, and then, oh look, 20 pound note. I just came across a 20 pound note in the street, you know, and kept walking. And then uh, a few minutes later, I came across another one. What, another 20 pound note? Take that. And then I came across another one. But what's going on? Just keep coming across 20 pound notes in the street. Anyway, keep walking, keep walking, keep walking, just make sure no one's looking. I kept coming across 20 pound notes. Eventually I picked them all up and, I've, and I, it was like a trail of 20 pound notes. And I, when I got to the end of it, there was a dead bank robber with a bag full of money. Oh, what did I do? I'm not telling you. It's not a true story. But anyway, that's the expression is to come across something. And he said, that's the worst, what, the worst? What? Just be the worst food I've ever come across. That could just be the worst food I've ever come across. Strong words. The joker who made it could be beyond my help. The joker who made it could be beyond my help. Yeah, sounds like he's exaggerating a little bit for the for the TV camera, but still anyway, let's go with it. It's the worst food he's ever come across. The joker who made it might be beyond his help. This actually may be true because you see from the episode that he tries to help Mick and... Mick's not really up for it. Hello. In 21 years of fucking cooking, I've never, ever refused to taste a dish. In 21 years of fucking cooking, I've never, ever refused to taste a dish. So here he is in the kitchen now, talking to Mick and Mick's wife. And he's not mincing his words. He's getting straight to the point. In 21 years of fucking cooking, I've never, ever refused to taste a dish. Cooking. I've never, ever refused to taste a dish. And when the lamb shank arrived on the table, I got told that it has a shelf life of 12 months, doesn't need refrigerating, and Dad didn't cook it. When the lamb shank arrived on the table, I got told that it had a shelf life of 12 months, something, 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 and Dad didn't even cook it. What was the something, something, something? Refrigerating, and Dad didn't cook it. Doesn't need refrigerating. Told that it has a shelf life of 12 months, doesn't need refrigerating, and Dad didn't cook it. It doesn't need refrigerating. So this lamb doesn't need refrigerating. Interesting structure, isn't it? Something needs doing, right? For example, this lamb needs refrigerating. Another way of saying it, this lamb needs to be refrigerated. It needs refrigerating. In this case, this lamb, uh, you know, this lamb doesn't need refrigerating. You can keep it on the shelf for 12 months. It's got a shelf life of 12 months. Should be alarm bells if you're a proper 
chef, no? Doesn't need refrigerating, and Dad didn't cook it. Mm. How in the fuck could you charge £11 for that? How in the fuck could you charge £11 for that? Tell me. Now, here's another use of swearing, right? Now, in questions, WH questions, where, who, why, what, you know, when, and so on, um, you can just add, not that you should, you shouldn't, of course, really, but people do, people add the word fuck, fuck, if you're from the north of England, fuck, fuck, lots of different ways of saying it, anyway, fuck, it's one of those episodes, so you can add the word fuck directly after the question word, okay, and it's a way of emphasising it. So, for example, what the fuck is this? Like, what is this? What the fuck is this? What the fuck? It's actually the fuck. What the fuck is this? Who the fuck are you? For example, what the fuck is going on? All right? Like, where are you? Where the fuck are you? Uh, what, what, you know, it's not with what time is it? Uh, not what the fuck time is it? It'd be what fucking time is it? Uh, uh, uh. How how are you? How are you? How the fuck are you? For example, um, and what does Gordon say? Gordon actually says, how in the fuck can you charge £11? So, you know, there's another option. How the fuck can you charge £11 for that? And how in the fuck can you charge £11 for that? How in the fuck? It's a pretty weird example of language, but it does show that fuck is one of the most versatile language, uh, versatile words in the English language. It can go almost anywhere in the sentence. We can transform it this way, that way. It's incredibly versatile, isn't it? Interesting that, that swear words often are the most sort of, uh, as I said, most sort of adaptable words grammatically. Um, and we use them in lots of different uh, sentences. How in the fuck can you charge £11 for that? Now, you could put the word fuck in that question in different places. For example, fucking how the... Fucking, how do you charge £11 for that? How in the fuck do you charge £11 for that? How do you fucking charge £11 for that? How do you charge fucking £11 for that? How do you charge £11 fucking pounds for that? How do you charge £11 for f fucking that? How do you charge £11 for that for fuck's sake? Okay. Be aware that um, uh, swearing is considered to be very rude in most situations. But, you know, here we are, Gordon Ramsay using it. I'm just trying to help you understand the way that people swear in British English. I'm not saying you should do it. Do what I do, do what I say, don't do what I do. All right. And when the lamb shank arrived on the table, I got told that it has a shelf life of 12 months, doesn't need refrigerating, and dad didn't cook it. How in the fuck could you charge £11 for that? Tell me. Most pubs around here all use the same sort of system. Mick, you're running a bistro. Where's the lamb shank? That's there the lamb shank. There you are, Gordon. That's his famous lamb shank. There you are, Gordon. That's his famous lamb shank. So he's like asking where the lamb shank is. Uh, and uh, she brings the box out and opens up the box. And there it is, this box of lamb shanks. <laughs> oh, God, it's not pretty. Oh, if you're eating nice lamb, you want it to be fresh, don't you? You don't want it to be vacuum-packed and kept in a box for nine months. Oh, oh. Doesn't bear thinking about. Mick, what in the fuck is inside the lamb shank? What in the fuck is inside the lamb shank, Mick? <laughs> Gordon Ramsay, right? I didn't tell you what he looks like. I mean, he's sort of... He's got this bright blonde hair. He's stocky and quite well built, and he's got like this face, right? He's got like these lines in his forehead. He's got like this sort of, I don't know how to describe his face, really. His face just seems chunky. He's got a square jaw. He looks tough, and he looks intimidating. And, you know, he's quite, I'm sure he's quite a frightening person to deal with. So if you've got Gordon Ramsay's face right up in your face going, how the fuck, what the fuck is in these lamb shanks, Mick? It's going to be quite off-putting and quite intimidating. But, you know, the point is that the, the, the reason why Gordon Ramsay can do it is because he backs it up. He backs it up with uh, all of his experience and all of his knowledge of cooking. And he backs it up with a sort of passion that shows he does... He is trying to make people cook good food, ultimately. 
that's how he justifies being rude to people. You know, I mean, does it justify... Not everyone likes Gordon Ramsay. He's quite a controversial person, you know, obviously, because of the way he talks and the way he acts. And a lot of people don't like him. But you can't argue with the fact that he gets results. Anyway. And how long has that been cooked for? How long has that been cooked for? So Mick doesn't know what, what the ingredients are of the lamb shank in this plastic bag. He doesn't know how long it's been cooked by the manufacturer, uh, which is, again, not a good sign for, for a restaurateur, is it? You've got to know what's in your food that you're preparing and, and providing to your customers. And how long has that been cooked for? For a dish never to be refrigerated. But it's all chemicals, isn't it? And Mick goes, well, it's all, it's all chemicals, isn't it? It's all chemicals, isn't it? He says with a sort of slightly smug look on his face. And Gordon Ramsay at this point is like hopping mad. Chemicals? But it's all chemicals, isn't it? Chemicals? It's got to be. E number two, E6134, E627, E262, thickener E415. God, how many E numbers was that? Oh, E numbers are like, you know, these evil chemicals. I say evil. I mean, you know, they I guess they're used to preserve the food or to ex enhance the flavor. And, you know, you know, some people say that E numbers are very unhealthy and that they can, you know, they're very bad for your health because the body can't really process them properly because they're basically just like synthetic chemicals. Uh E this, E102, E1 this, E all these different E numbers. It's it's really, really awful. That orange squash, remember the orange squash I told you about before? The stuff that you used to get in the supermarket in the 80s in these big bottles, this industrial orange squash that um, all of our parents used to feed to us because they didn't know any better. That orange squash was revealed. Now, there was this thing, right, in the 80s where a lot of kids had hyperactive behaviour, hyperactivity. That's where the kids suddenly are running around and they, you can't stop them. They're just running around. They've got far too much energy running around all the time. They go, they're going mad. And all the parents were like, what's wrong with these kids? Why, have, why are they so insane? Why have they got this energy? Why can we not shut them down? And why are they losing, you know, why, the, why do they get so upset and so crazy? Um, and it turned out it was the orange squash. The orange squash contained a, a chemical called E102. And E102 uh, was, uh, people said that it, caused uh, major hyperactivity in kids and uh, and so there was this big scare around the around uh, the media and stuff about e102 which is otherwise known as tartrazine uh, and um, it's a synthetic lemon yellow dye it gives the color and uh, let's have a look at e102 side effects um, so E102, otherwise known as tartrazine, is a synthetic yellow azo dye derived from coal tar. Coal tar. Tar is that thick black stuff that they use to put on roads. It's So tartrazine is derived from coal tar and it's been banned in several countries like Austria and Norway because of serious side effects such as causing potentially lethal asthma attacks. And, and rashes on the skin, DNA damage, and ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. So, I mean, that's just one of the E numbers, but this bloody lamb contains all these different E numbers. Uh, I don't think it's got E102 in there, but um, a lot of E numbers for, you know, preserve, preserving the food and providing colour and flavour. It's basically a bag of chemicals. Ugh. E number two, E6134, E627, E262, thickener E415, E4112. Do you feel like having a shit? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Do you feel like having a shit? E102, E164, E457, thickener E749. Do you feel like having a shit? I've n to be honest, I've never, <laughs> I've never heard that uh, question before, except for in this show. Do you feel like having a shit, Mick? Do you feel like having a shit? Because you f you should feel like having a shit. This is shocking. Do you feel like having a shit? <laughs> 415. E4112. Do you feel like having a shit? Thank fuck I didn't eat it. Oh, God. Thank fuck I didn't eat it. Okay. Which is another, like, you know, thank God I didn't eat it. Thank fuck I didn't eat it. Oh, dear. Don't be offended, all right? Don't Please don't be offended because it's just not worth it, all right? Because 
they're just words. It's it's not really that bad. Don't be offended. It's all fine. Just don't use them. You don't have to use them. But at least learning how people really speak. And this is this show was a seriously popular show on the UK. It used to be on um, in the week. I think it was on like a Wednesday evening at about 9 p.m. Um, 9 p.m. is the time in the UK when you get after 9 p.m. That's when children are expected to be in bed. And that's when they start to show programs that contain more adult stuff like rude language and, and, and things like that. Uh, so it's probably on 9 or 10 p.m. Uh, and many, many millions of people used to watch this stuff. And we all survived, despite the swearing. Um, so, uh, thank fuck I didn't eat it. So what did we have before? We had, what the fuck is that? Okay. Now, there is a less rude version. You could say, what the hell? What the hell is that? Or even, what the heck? What the heck is that? Now, that's the same thing, but less rude. So... You don't have to say, what the fuck is that? You could say, what the hell is that? Or what the heck is that? And thank fuck I didn't eat it. Thank fuck we didn't go out. Look at the rain. Thank fuck we didn't go out. Thank fuck I didn't eat it. You could say, thank God instead. Thank God I didn't eat it. All right? Which is generally in the culture less rude than saying the F word. Um, all right. Do you feel like having a shit? <laughs> I am amused by that one, I have to say. Thickener E415, E4112, do you feel like having a shit? Thank fuck I didn't eat it. Sugar flavourings, colour, E150D, spices, emulsifier, E322, yeast extract. Come on, Mick. Fuck me. I'm surprised you haven't fucking killed off half the population in Oakhampton. I'm surprised you haven't fucking killed off half the population of Oakhampton. To kill off the population, I think you get the idea. Not just to kill the population, but to kill off. That means completely exterminate. Not just kill them, exterminate them, kill them off. I'm surprised you haven't fucking killed off half the population of Oakhampton. <laughs> All right then. Should we talk about the duck? Yeah, go on. What the fuck did you put in that sauce? So, by the way, I'm just going to let you listen to this. It's about a minute and 20 minutes long. So I'll let you listen to the whole thing, then we'll break it down so that you understand it all bit by bit, okay? Should we talk about the duck? Yeah, go on. What the fuck did you put in that sauce? It's like some fucking sci-fi sperm. Sci-fi sperm? Yeah, where's the, where's the orange juice? So it's an orange squash? Yes. Yeah, a, a concentrate? Yeah. You know, all the reports of the people who do eat love the sauce, you know. I've got to be so honest, sir. And the do. lamb shank. Yeah. I've never okay. had one complaint. As a restaurateur, whatever you want to call yourself, your responsibility is providing them with at least something fresh, and especially at fucking eleven quid. It's about right, isn't it? About right. Four times it. Help. Well, he's a stubborn fucker. This I one. I know he is a stubborn fucker. Right. I'll be the first one to admit that. But we desperately, desperately need help from yourself. And I'm sorry, I'm going to get emotional. I don't want you to get upset. I no, am, because I... my husband's been slated to death and we worked so hard for this business and it's just killing us all. Come on. Wait, I'll just and, and I'm not right. denying that you guys work fucking hard. I can see that in your face. Yeah. I can see that from your daughter. Well, I just don't know what I'm saying. I'm going to get some fresh air. Fuck me. Ooh, okay. It's all getting a bit dramatic in the kitchen there. Uh, did you follow that? Did you follow what the problems were? Um, and uh, let's go through that again then and break it down. And I'm just writing some notes here on some of the language that uh, uh, I noticed. And I'll, I'll be putting this on the page for the episode so you can check all this stuff out. But let's go through it now then and let's see if we can pick up some vocab and just notice a few things about the language. All right. Should we talk about the duck? You get that? Did you get that? Six words. Shall we talk about the duck? Should we talk about the duck? Can you repeat that? Should we talk about the duck? Should we talk about the duck? Shall we talk about the duck? Should we talk about the duck? Shall we? 
used to to give a, a suggestion, isn't it? Shall we talk about the duck? Shall we? Shall we talk about the duck? Shall we talk about the duck? Yeah, go on. Yeah, go on. What the fuck did you put in that sauce? <sighs> what the fuck did you put in that sauce? What did you put in that sauce? What the fuck did you put in that sauce? What the hell did you put in that sauce? What the fuck did you put in that sauce? Put in that sauce? It's like some fucking sci-fi sperm. <laughs> That's a pretty weird uh, image. It's like some sort of sci-fi sperm. Okay, I'm going to have to explain that now, aren't I? Yes, I am. Okay, it's like some sort of sci-fi sperm. So the sauce, this is this this sauce that was, you know, served with a duck made from orange squash, this brightly coloured orange stuff, orange juice, basically, full of chemicals. And he's like, it was like some sort of sci-fi sci -fi sperm. Sci-fi, you know what that is? Science fiction, right? It was like something out of a science fiction movie. You know, like, uh, imagine like the blood of an alien or something. It would be brightly orange. But in this case, Gordon's analogy is not that it was blood, it was sperm. Sci-fi sperm, it's a really disgusting image, but, you know, it, it's quite uh, its quite a good image for describing how awful this orange uh, sauce was. What is sperm, Luke? Do I have to explain that? Sperm is, uh, let's try and do it scientifically, okay? Sperm is, um, is what... Uh, uh, so okay, so when uh, <laughs> when a man loves a woman, um, and they want to make babies, right? Now for the baby to to exist, yes, I'm doing this. All right. So um, right, so the 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 mum has an egg, right? And for that egg to be fertilised, there needs to be a sperm. So one single sperm is what comes through and fertilizes the egg, right? Now, men of many species, most species, I believe, have many millions of sperm. And to, and when it's produced, when it's produced, you, you note the use of the passive there to avoid having to say who produces it or how or what produces it. When sperm is produced, it it comes out in the form of a kind of a liquid, doesn't it? Okay. So that can also be called sperm. So the stuff that is produced uh, when um, uh, when grown married adults um, choose to have uh, have children, uh, sperm is is. I think you get the idea. I think you just Google it if you. Well, no, don't 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 Google it. Actually, don't Google. It. Just look it up in an old fashioned dictionary, not a picture dictionary, just a normal one. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, uh, Gordon Ramsay said that the orange sauce looked like sci-fi sperm which is like some sort of disgusting, uh, brightly coloured orange sperm from another dimension. But that's honestly how disgusting the stuff was, apparently. But it's quite a funny use of language. And in fact, even in the middle of that, Mick's wife, who's like all serious, standing there, you know, it's a really serious moment. She's like, sci-fi sperm? She almost finds it funny as well, because it's such a bizarre image. Anyway, let's not get caught up on sci-fi sperm, shall we? Let's not spend too too long on that on YouTube or... Oh, by the way, this is on YouTube as well, this episode. Uh, all right, so anyway, let's carry on. Yeah, go on. What the fuck did you put in that sauce? It's like some fucking sci-fi sperm. Sci-fi sperm? Yeah, where's the, where's the orange juice? So it's an orange squash? Yes. Yeah, A concentrate? Yeah. You know, all the reports of the people we do eat love the sauce so he's saying that all the reports of the people all the reports of the people we're doing i can't really understand what he's getting at but i think he's saying that you know people say that they love the sauce all the reports of the people we're doing we do eat love yeah, anyway people love the sauce he also says the sauce is orange squash okay i've been through that we know what that is it's a kind of concentrated orange juice concentrate concentrate now um so concentrate is a verb. We know that. It means focus. Come on, concentrate on your work, for example. That's the verb concentrate. But concentrate's got other meanings too. And as a noun, as an uncountable noun, concentrate means usually like juice that's been reduced. It's like a concentrated form of juice. And uh, it's produced like that 
uh, because it lasts longer, I think. I'm not sure quite how it works, but anyway, you get orange juice, which is freshly squeezed, and then you get orange juice from concentrate. So concentrate means that the juice has been reduced down so that I guess there's less water in it and there's it's more... Um, well, it's more concentrated, right? So all you need to do with concentrate is you add water. So when you buy orange juice from concentrate, it means that um, that water has been added to it to turn it into the juice that you have now. So orange juice from concentrate lasts longer, but it doesn't taste as good as freshly squeezed orange juice, okay? So if you ever see the word concentrate or from concentrate on the side of uh, a a carton of orange juice, it means it's not freshly squeezed. Okay, all right. Yeah, you ever see that? You ever see the word concentrate written on the side of a, a carton of orange juice? That's what that means. Now, actually, here's a joke for you. I'm going to tell you a joke, all right? Now, don't get overexcited. You probably won't find it funny, but I will explain it to you, and then you definitely won't find it funny. But any, in any case, uh, I like jokes. Who doesn't? Here's a joke for you. Um, so why did the why did the supermodel... It's a bit a bit prejudiced towards supermodels, but anyway. Why did the supermodel stare at the orange juice? Why did the supermodel stare at the orange juice? Because it said concentrate on the carton. It said concentrate on the carton, so so she concentrated on the car carton. Okay, never mind. Jokes. What are you gonna do? Jokes. Alright, fine. So uh anyway, what about the juice? It's from concentrate. And uh Mick is like stubbornly unwilling to accept that there's anything wrong with this. Yes. I concentrate. Yeah. You know, all the reports of the people we do eat love the sauce. You know. I've got to be so honest there. And the you? lamb shanks. Yeah. I've never and, you know, people love the sauce and the lamb shanks. And then Michelle, the daughter, says, yeah, I've never had one complaint about the lamb. Lamb shanks. Yeah. I've never okay. had one complaint. As a restaurateur, whatever you want to call yourself, your responsibility is providing them with at least something fresh. Your responsibility is providing them with at least something fresh. Okay, that's clear. And especially at fucking 11 quid. Especially at 11 quid. You know, 11 quid. Quid is pounds. That's like, you know, slang for pounds. We say quid. Five quid, 11 quid, you know, whatever. So quid. Uh, your responsibility is to provide them with something at least fresh, especially at 11 quid. I mean, come on, he's right, isn't he? He does, Mick does have a responsibility to provide them with half decent food, especially when you're charging £11 for a dish. It's got to be, you know, proper food, right? And quit. It's about right, though, isn't it? But Mick's response is, it's about right, though, isn't it? It's about right, though, isn't it? Now, what's that? What does he say? It's about right, though, isn't it? It's about right, though, isn't it? Did you actually, do you know what he's actually saying there? Can you identify that? So your responsibility is to sell blah, 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 really proper fresh food, especially 11 quid. It's about right though, isn't it? It's about right though, isn't it? It's about, it's about right though, isn't it? It's about right though, isn't it? And what he means there is he thinks 11 pounds is about right as a price. He, think it, he thinks it's a, an appropriate price. It's about right though, isn't it? 11 pounds. And so Mick's completely unwilling to um, accept that that eleven pounds is too much for this kind of processed stuff. And Gordon Ramsay kind of shocked by that. And then he he says Mick is stubborn. And his wife, uh, Mick's wife, goes, "Yeah, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that." So I'm, you know, I'll be the first person to admit that he is stubborn. Remember, stubborn. Stubborn means you are unwilling to change. Let's have a little look at the. Um, Let's have a look at the Collins Dictionary uh, definition for stubborn. Um, I've been using the Collins Dictionary online recently. I just find it to be really good. Um, let's have a look at how they define stubborn. Uh, CollinsDictionary.com says that stubborn is an adjective. Someone who is stubborn or who behaves in a stubborn way. Someone who, uh, who behaves in a stubborn way is determined to do what they want and is unwilling to change their mind. And it's often negative. Okay. For example, he's a stubborn character. He's used to getting his own way. His face was set in an expression of stubborn determination. Okay. Um, and stubbornly is an adverb. He stubbornly refused to tell her. Uh, okay. Stubborn. So, you know, um, determined to do what they want. I'm going to do it my way and I'm not going to change and I'm not going to change my mind. That's stubborn. 
And she says, he's in, and Gordon Ramsay describes him as a stubborn fucker. So here's a bit of, here's an example of how swearing is, is used quite creatively. We've turned the word fuck into a noun for a person. What do you, you know, what's the noun for a, a person? It's a fucker, you stupid fucker. You stupid fucker, you ugly fucker, for example. And in this case, it's he's a stubborn fucker, isn't he? It's about right, though, isn't it? About right? Four times it. Help. Well, he's a stubborn fucker, this I one. I know he is. He's a stubborn fucker, this one. And she's like, I know he is. In fact, the wife, I can't remember her name, but she goes, help. She actually says help at one point. Uh, after Mick has gone, oh, it's about right though, isn't it? For four of them, about right. And she goes, help. As if to say, Gordon, please help us. This man is a nightmare. Help. Well, he's a stubborn fucker, this I one. I know he is a stubborn fucker. Right. I'll be the first one to admit that. But we desperately, desperately need help. We desperately, desperately need help. Wow, that's a quite a sincere uh, call for help, literally. Uh, we desperately, desperately need help. But it's quite a nice collocation, isn't it? Desperately need. Desperately need more time. We desperately need help. I desperately need the toilet, for example. Um, all right, so we desperately need, t desperately, desperately need help. Desperately, desperately need help from yourself from yourself meaning from Gordon and this is where she gets upset because she says my husband's been slated to death slated if someone's been slated it means they've been strongly criticized I don't know who's slated him maybe it's reviewers in in a, in a magazine or newspaper or something maybe it's Gordon Ramsay because he did just slate him there didn't he saying all these things uh, but it's probably lots of other people too who've slated uh, Mick for his, you know, cooking style or whatever. He's been slated to death, and she says, and it's killing us off as a family. It's killing us off means that, you know, what's happening is just killing the family. Killing the family off means completely killing them. It's sad. It's really sad that she's really desperate. Because this guy, Mick, is so stubborn, he's unwilling to change, even though his actions are causing them major problems, causing them to lose money because the restaurant's failing. She's desperately in need of his help, of Gordon's help. Because her husband's been slated to death and it's killing us off. And she starts crying. It's quite sad. Help from yourself. And I'm sorry, I'm going to get emotional. I don't want you to get upset. I no, am, because I'm... my husband's been slated to death and we worked so hard for this business and it's just killing us off. We've worked so hard for this business and it's just killing us off. And um, she says, at the beginning of that, she says, I d you know, and I'm going to get emotional now. If you get emotional, it means that you, you know, for example, you start crying or you start losing control of your emotions a bit. I'm going to get emotional now. And then Gordon says, I don't want you to get upset. Because obviously his, his purpose is that he wants to try and, you know, fix the problem. I don't want you to get upset. Now, upset is an interesting word. Because, and I think I got a message somewhere on email or somewhere recently from a listener who said, can you explain what upset means and how we use the word upset? So, okay, let's have a look at the word upset. Now, to be upset, so it's an adjective, to be upset and typically to get upset, which means to become upset be upset uh, she's a bit upset or she got upset or she, you know, don't get upset so if you are upset it means that basically you're you've become emotional now if you're upset it could mean that you are um like sad or it could mean that you're angry but it means basically that your emotions are not sort of um calm so get upset it's usually when you're like really emotional or you get really angry or you start crying. Um, and so that's upset. So it can be, you can be upset for different reasons and you can be upset in different ways. One of them would be just sad. Like, for example, if, you're, if your dog died, if your dog, you know, if your dog died, you'd be really upset. Oh, poor Fluffy. I can't believe we've had him since we were a kid. And 
just gonna miss him so much it's like oh don't be up don't he's like oh gosh he's really he's really upset about the dog i don't know what to do like i just i don't know if i can carry on because he just loved fluffy so much and it's like we'll we'll get another dog we'll just get another you don't know we can't get another dog it's not never get a bit of this right it's like don't get so upset it's just a dog it's not just a dog you don't say that you know for example um so that's one example of getting upset and the other one would be getting angry getting angry like for example um you know like a guy says to his girlfriend he's like so um you know i've invited all my friends over tonight we're going to watch the football okay and she goes but it's but it's our anniversary and he's like oh oh god yeah sorry and she's like you forgot i can't believe you forgot about our anniversary simon I can't believe you forgot about our anniversary again, Simon. I've, I've had it with you. It's like, don't get upset. Don't get... I'll, no, never mind. I'll call them. I'll tell them it's the, the, it's, it's cancelled. I'm going to cancel it. It's like, no, no, that's it, Simon. That's it. I've had it with you now. Right, there's an ex- another example of someone getting upset. So you can get upset because you're angry. We can get upset because you're sad. So anyway, um, I think her name is Liz, but I'm not sure. I think Liz gets really unhappy she she's sad and she's she's uh, she says I'm going to get emotional now and Gordon Ramsay says I don't want you to get upset from yourself and I'm sorry I'm going to get emotional I don't want you to get upset I no, am because I... my husband's been slated to death and we worked so hard for this business and it's just killing us all Wait. at this point Mick has put his arm around his wife and he's trying to comfort her and Gordon Ramsay's just standing there looking really awkward, like, uh, awkward. So he's he's kind of shocked and he's obviously realising that there's there are lots of issues here, a lot of issues around why this restaurant is failing. And it's, it's it, the issues are that, that Mick, it's his fault. And she's his wife is really upset, but Mick is like unwilling to change. And in fact, he's, he's sort of going, oh, come here, darling, it's all right. It's just really not fair to do that. So I think Gordon Ramsay's a bit shocked by Mick and it's a you know it's it's sad really that Mick is it's 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 not good you know he's um his actions are are really not helping his family it's it's kind of sad but he's in denial about it he's not willing to accept the truth I would say and, and I'm not right. denying that you guys work fucking hard I can see that in your face yeah I can see that from your daughter well, I just don't know what I'm saying and Mick's just like, oh, I, just, I don't know what to say. Okay. I'm going to get some fresh air. And Gordon goes, I'm going to get some fresh air. Okay, then. All right, folks. So you're keeping up with this. So I did write some notes down there as I was reading this. And again, as I said, I'll be putting this stuff up on the page so you can see the words like sci-fi sperm and uh, orange squash and concentrate and a stub the word stubborn and we desperately need help my husband's been slated to death and it's killing us off i don't want you to get upset and so on all right so let's go on to the next part of the video and what happens here this is where things start to get even more problematic and the this uh, scene is called family at war so this is where the family have, have kind of uh, split and uh, they're not getting on with each other at all. So let's listen to Family at War. And this one is three minutes long. So I guess I'm going to play you the first minute or so. And then we'll go through it uh, bit by bit. Okay then. So here we go. What's going on? Can you try and work it out? Can you listen carefully? Try and follow it. Here we are. Before I can start fixing this restaurant, I need to see how bad things really are. So tonight, I'm filling the bistro with 30 locals and I'm going to watch the Martin family in action. Have you got peas on? No, so I'm putting them on. That's what Fucking I'm saying. Fucking talk to me then, Mick, and I'll know what you want. Mick used to have a burger van, and it shows. He's working on his own and leaving Mo to second guess what he's doing. Mick, is there any chance you could talk a little bit to Mo? It, at least she could help you a bit more if you open up and ask, no? If I say anything five minutes later, she forgets. So what's the point of oh, telling like her? Fuck too, right? You do love. Well, whatever, mate. As long as you can make me look small, you're happy. But if you was to do all your garnishes and vegetables, I'd know where I am. But I'm doing half of your bloody job as well tonight. It's like a one-man band in there. Like he's back in his burger van, cooking in and out of the microwave, and 
totally fucking upside down. I mean, without Mo in the kitchen, he's fucked. We're only an hour and a half into service, but there's already a huge backlog of orders. A mix started to crumble. I don't want no food sent down until I tell you. Okay. No food sent down until he says, okay? Okay. No more food sent down. No more orders. You can't so handle it. That's what it is. You can't handle it. Sorry? How long no more orders? I've got to wait until he says. If I send one thing down, I'll get my head bit off. I don't. This is ridiculous. If Mick can't cope sending out ready meals, he shouldn't be running a kitchen. Joe, I don't really care what they say. I can only do what I can right. do. I'd rather you didn't take it out you of know. me because I'm just asking. I've had to delay two tables till half past eight. Go upstairs and where you belong. Right, I will. I'll stay up there. I like that. Okay, so basically Gordon has said, I need to see the, the family in action. So he's basically he somehow managed to fill the restaurant with 30 people. And uh, he's now in the restaurant observing the way in which they uh, carry out their service um, in the kitchen. And it's pretty ugly, really, because it doesn't work because Mick can't really handle it. He can't handle the pressure of serving to 30 people, especially when you've got Gordon Ramsay looking over your shoulder. Um, so let's let's go through that stuff again. And there's lots of lots of language there. Um, here we go. Before I can start fixing this restaurant, I need to see how bad things really are. So Before I can start fixing this restaurant, I need to see how bad things really are, okay? Need to see how bad things really are. So tonight, I'm filling the bistro with 30 locals and I'm gonna watch the Martin family in action. So tonight, I'm filling the bistro with 30 locals and I'm gonna watch the Martin family in action, okay? So tonight, I'm filling the bistro with 30 locals and I'm gonna watch the Martin family in action. Did you hear that that sound? That was the that was the duck being removed from a plastic bag. It's disgusting. Listen for that. 30 locals and I'm going to watch the Martin family in action. Have you got peas on? No, so I'm putting them on. He's going to his wife. His his wife's name's Mo, by the way. You go, "Have you got peas on?" No, so I'm going to put them on. So he's not very nice. Have you got peas on? No, so I'm going to put them on. Meaning, are you cooking peas? No, well, I'm going to do it then. Oh, no, so I'm putting them on. To put peas on means, you know, to start cooking peas. That's what Fashion, I'm saying. Talk to me then, Mick, and I'll know what you want. Mick used to have a burger van, and it shows. He's working on his own and leaving Mo to second guess what he's doing. He's leaving Mo to second guess what he's doing. Second guess? I mean, surely you could just say he's leaving Mo to guess what he's doing, but to second guess, second guess is a uh, is a phrase. It doesn't mean just guess. It means to guess in advance what someone will do or or, or what will happen. So it's really second guess is like emphasising that it's in advance. Okay, second guess someone is sort of predict what someone else is going to do. So she's trying to second guess what he's going to do. She's leaving, he's leaving her to second guess what, um, what he's going to do next. Joe's, he's working on his own and leaving Mo to second guess what he's doing. Mick, is there any chance you could talk a little bit to Mo? It, at least she could help you a bit more if you open up and ask, no? Is there any chance? It's a nice way of making a request, right? Is there any chance he could talk a little bit more? Which is, you know, that's Gordon Ramsay being a bit diplomatic there. Instead of saying, fucking talk more. He's going, is there any chance he could talk a bit more and open up? Open up, you know, if you're not communicating, you're kind of closed, right? If you open up, it means that you talk about what's going on in your head and you reveal things that are going on. Open up. And often open up, we, we mean sort of talk about how you feel as well. So, for example, you know, if, if you're talking to a... Uh, uh, a friend of yours has got a problem, like her dog died, or his dog died, right? And he's still really upset about it. And it's like, well, what's the matter with John? It's like, he he seems really upset. Uh, he's not answering my calls and he just seems all closed off. Is he okay? It's like, I don't know. I think he's really upset about the dog still. I tell you what, I'll go over there tonight. We'll have a cup of tea and let's see if I can talk to him. And then hopefully he will open up and tell us how he's feeling. Let's see if we can try and get him to open up a bit. So to start revealing how he really feels. And guess what he's doing? 
Mick, is there any chance you could talk a little bit to Mo? If it, at least she could help you a bit more if you open up and ask, no? I say to you five minutes later, she forgets. So what's the point? Oh, right. I tell her, and then five minutes later, she forgets, he says. I tell her, and then five minutes later, she forgets. So what's the point? All right, it's not very helpful. He's saying that he tells her, and five minutes later, she forgets. So what's the point? If I say to you five minutes later, she forgets. So what's the point? Oh, right. Fuck too, right. And she goes, like fuck do I. Like fuck do I. All right. So if I tell her, then five minutes later, she forgets. Like fuck do I. Which is like saying, no, I don't. Like fuck do I. Like, yeah, I guess the most normal way of saying it would be like, no, I don't. But here is another inventive use of swearing. Like fuck do I. Which just means, I, no, I don't. Right. If I tell her and then five minutes later she forgets, so what's the point? Like fuck do I? Oh, like fuck do I? You do love. Oh whatever, mate. Oh whatever, mate, she says. God, it doesn't seem fun working with Mick. If you can make me look small, you're happy. You know, if and then he goes, If you can make me look small, you're happy. So he thinks that she's just trying to make him look small. If you can make me look small, you're happy. As long as you can make me look small, you're happy. Well, if you was to do all your garnishes and vegetables, I'd know where I am. If you was to do all your garnishes and vegetables, I'd know where I am. If you was to do, like if you did, or if you were to do, if you were to do all your garnishes and vegetables, meaning if you did all your garnishes and vegetables, if you was to do is, you know, technically bad English, isn't it? Um, uh, it should be if you were to do all your garnishes and vegetables. Garnishes are like little side salads that you put on a plate. It's like some lettuce, maybe some carrot and some other bits of salad, a garnish. It's just there to sort of provide a bit of decoration to the plate, but it's edible. That's a garnish, usually made of bits of salad. If you did all your garnishes and vegetables, I'd know where I am. Well, I'm doing half of your bloody job as well tonight. It's like a one-man band in there, like he's back in his burger van, cooking in and out of the microwave and totally fucking upside down totally fucking upside down if something's upside down it's the wrong way round isn't it well you got ups upside down so normally uh, the bottom is at the bottom and that the top is at the top but if it's upside down then it means the top is at the bottom and the bottom is at the top all right upside down um, you know for example if you are if you've got some ketchup in a bottle and you need to get the ketchup out ketchup doesn't come out of bottles easily you have to turn it upside down and sort of shake it around a bit right turn it upside down wrong way round would mean that the front is at the back it's wrong way round okay and inside out was would be like if you have a t-shirt and the t-shirt the design of the t-shirt is on the wrong side so the label is sticking out your t-shirt's inside out you idiot um, you know, or you got it, it's wrong way round, or it's upside down. Upside down. So, um, he's saying it's like a one-man band in there, it's like he's back in his burger van, but everything's upside down. It just means that it's all disorganised. Like a and totally fucking upside down. I mean, without Mo in the kitchen, he's fucked. Without Mo in the kitchen, he's fucked. So, another bit of swearing there, and if you're fucked, it means that you are... You're in a really bad situation. You're finished. Yeah. We're only an hour and a half into service, but there's already a huge backlog of orders. We're already an hour and a half into service, and there's already a huge backlog, a huge backlog of orders, uh, a backlog of orders. So in the restaurant, right, you have orders coming through. The order comes through. You put it up on the on the notice board. You prepare that order. It goes out. Okay. Now the idea is you've got to keep the speed up so that the you you you're cooking the orders quickly enough, and eventually the orders start to start to back up. You end up with more and more orders, and then you get a backlog of orders. That's where there's all these orders that need to be cooked, and they're building up and up and up. There's a backlog of orders. So in any other business where you get orders coming in that need to go out, and they build up and up and up, you end up with a backlog. A big backlog of orders. It's like, John, yeah, I've got a bit of a problem. Um, look, because Simon is sick and Shirley's not available, we've just got a massive backlog of orders. So I'm going to need you to come in today and, and work in the warehouse. All right, so a backlog of, of orders. Um, 
Okay, we've got... Right. But there's already a huge backlog of orders. And mix started to crumble. Mix starting to crumble. So, crumble. I think you know the word crumble, right? I mean, um, crumble means fall apart, collapse. Imagine an old castle, an old stone castle that was built in uh, the Middle Ages, like in the in the twelfth century. One of these old castles, and over the centuries, it's got it's got um, it's become older and older, and the the stones are starting to crumble. You know, like bits of the stones are falling off. Um, okay, crumble. Also, if you had a biscuit, if you like, I'm going to take this biscuit to to work with me today, and you put the biscuit in your pocket, and you're going to work, and you get on the train, and people bump into you, and you're like, oh god, the biscuit's going to crumble in my pocket, and you you put your hand in, it's like, oh, time to eat my biscuit when you get to work, and then you realise it's been it's crumbled, it's it's been crushed in your pocket, and it's just crumbled into dust. Oh, what happened to my biscuit? Oh. What's the matter? Oh, it's my biscuit. It's all crumbled. Oh, don't try not to get too upset. All right. Uh, so uh, Mick is starting to crumble. So he's he's kind of collapsing um, because he can't deal with the pressure. Orders. And Mick started to crumble. I don't want no food sent down until I tell you. I don't want no food sent down. I don't want no food. So this is more of Mick's dodgy English. Although, you know, plenty of people speak like that. But I don't want no food. So it's a double negative. He means I don't want any food. I don't want no food sent down. Started to crumble. I don't want no food sent down until I tell you. Okay. No food sent down until he says. Okay. okay. No more food sent down. No more. He can't handle it. That's what it is. He can't handle it. He can't handle it. He can't handle it. To handle it is like to, to, to be able to deal with the, the, the pressure. He just can't handle it. He can't handle the pressure. Handle, H-A-N-D-L-E. He can't handle it. He can't can't deal with it. Can't take it. Can't He just can't handle the pressure. He can't handle it. Okay. No more food sent down. No more orders. He can't handle it. That's what it is. He can't handle it. Sorry? How long no more orders? I've got to wait until it says, if I send one thing down, I'll get my head bit off. I don't. If I send one bit of food down, I'll get my head bit off. So again, not quite correct English. I will get my head bit off. What's wrong with that? What's what's? Where's the incorrect uh, part of that? I will get my head bit off. It should be bitten, right? To get your head bitten off. Now, to get your head bitten off is a you know it's a decent phrase, uh, interesting expression. If someone bites your head off, it means they. They get really angry with you and probably shout at you. Like, for example, Mick, um, duck on table for two. I told you no more food, for example. Sorry, neighbours. Sorry, apologising to my neighbours. Like, oh, why is he shouting again? Well, he's probably doing another podcast. Yes, I do that. Shouting on the podcast. Um, so, what was it? Uh, to get your head bitten off. It's when someone shouts at you. Some angry thing like, I told you no more food. Now get out. So, oh God, I bit my head off. Okay. To bite someone's head off. Right. Now, not literally, of course, but just it's an idiom. To bite someone's head off means to shout at someone or be really angry. Say some really angry things to someone. You know, like, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to send any more orders down because I'll get my head bitten off. To get your head bitten off. Okay. Um, all right. I daren't. I daren't do it. I dare not do it. I don't dare do it. I daren't do it. I'll get my head bit off or I'll get my head bitten off. I've got to wait until it says, if I send one thing down, I'll get my head bit off. I daren't. This is ridiculous. If Mick can't cope sending out ready meals, he shouldn't be running a kitchen. If Mick can't cope sending out ready meals, he shouldn't be running a kitchen. Okay, now I'm going to let you listen to the second half of this without any interruption. Let's see if you can just follow what's going on, all right? Here we go. Sending out ready meals, he shouldn't be running a kitchen. Joe, I don't really care what they say. I can only do what I can right, do. I'd rather you didn't take it out of me because I'm just asking. I've had to delay two tables till half past I've eight. Got and where you belong. Right, I will. I'll stay up there. I like that. Too. Michelle's impressive. She's the one person here who is in control. Sadly, she's now been left to face the fallout from her dad's incompetence. 
Yeah, I've been waiting about an hour and a half, yeah. Too long, to be fair. I've lost count of the minutes and this has gone too long, really. We're hungry. Desperate. <laughs> Those meals Mick did manage to get out of the kitchen are now being sent back. We've got a phone there to communicate. Don't no, come down here and try and make a scene because you're on camera. Oh, you're the one doing it. Can you ask them to shut the kitchen down, please? Because I refuse to. to work with my husband like this any longer. Right, I'll go and sort it out. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to sort it out. I'm so sorry, but the beach door is closed. My husband's big fucking dream is a complete farce. Where's he gone? I don't know, Gordon. I don't fucking care. Fuck it, Mick. Come on. I can't. I'm not going to fucking have a heart attack over this. I don't want you to My have a fucking heart attack. Fucking, uh, I don't want you to have a heart attack over this. My heart's fucking booming. I just don't want it. I'm his daughter, and he speaks to me like shit, like mum, you know, and that's his wife. You know, and he thinks he does it because he thinks he gets away with it. He can't get away with it. I can take the knocks. So I think, like, I try to take all the knocks for everybody. Uh, even I've got a breaking point. Oh, okay. So, you know, basically what you heard was um, um, it all falling apart and um, the kitchen closes and Mick goes outside to smoke a cigarette um, and basically it's all falling to pieces and, you know, they're all arguing with each other. It's bloody awful. Dan. This is ridiculous. If Mick can't cope sending out ready meals, he shouldn't be running a kitchen. Yeah. He can't cope, he can't handle it, he can't take it, he can't deal with it. Four expressions. He can't cope, uh, can't uh, cope, can't handle it. Um, okay. Can't take it and can't deal with it. All right. Joe, I don't really care what they say. I can only do what I can do. I don't really care what they say. I can only do what I can do. So despite the... the uh, According to Mick, he's doing his best, basically. I can only do what I can do. Yeah, what they say. I can only do what I can right. do. I'd rather you didn't take it out you on know. me because I'm... And Michelle's very calm and she says, I'm ra I'd rather you didn't take it out on me. I'd rather you didn't take it out on me. If you take it out on someone, it means you express your anger and frustration and you project it on someone else. Don't take it out on me, for example. Right. And we've all had that. We've all been in that situation where you're with people and let's say, you know, you're feeling really angry and stressed out. Whatever the situation is, maybe you're driving, you're trying to get somewhere with your family and you're driving and it's stressful and you're trying to find the right exit off the motorway. And some, you know, someone else in the family is navigating and you're stressed out and they've made a mistake and you're and or you made a mistake and you missed the 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 turning and like oh for Christ's sake what the f can't you read a map and the and you you know the person goes don't take it out on me that was that wasn't my fault don't take it out on me so like, I'm sorry I'm just feeling really stressed out I know you are but don't take it out on me it's not my fault to take it out on someone means to sort of put your anger and stress on someone else so take it out like um to uh Re to release your anger and stress and put it on someone else, to take it out on someone. Don't take it out on me. Right, so, I'd rather you didn't take it out on know, me. I'm I'd rather you didn't take it out on me. Notice that? I'd rather you didn't. I'd rather you didn't take it out on me. So don't take it out on me. I'd rather you didn't take it out on me. Yes, I'm, I'd rather you didn't. So past tense. Um, I'd rather you didn't take it out on me. Yeah, past tense, even though she's talking about the present. We don't say, I'd rather you don't. No, it's, I'd rather you didn't. Mm-hmm. I'd rather you went to... Mm -hmm. I'd rather you didn't. Uh, let's see. I'd rather you go. I'd rather go. I would rather go. Obviously, we know that one, right? I would rather, and then an infinitive form. It's like, what would you rather? Would you rather have tea or coffee? I'd rather have tea, please. Okay? But I'd rather you, if you're talking about... Uh, criticizing someone's behavior, asking and, and saying that you want them to behave differently, it would be, I'd rather you, and then a uh, past tense, not to talk about the past, but to talk about the present or the future, right? It's like a second conditional. I'd rather you didn't talk to me like that. I'd rather you worked a bit harder in the restaurant, please. Okay, I'd rather you didn't, or I'd rather you did something. I'd rather you didn't take it out on me. 
He shouldn't be running a kitchen. Joe, I don't really care what they say. I can only do what I can right, do. I'd rather you didn't take it out you of me because I'm just asking. I've had to delay two tables till half past I've eight. Upstairs, we? I've had to delay two tables until half past eight. This is Michelle talking, the daughter. And then Gordon Ramsay's obviously quite impressed by Michelle. She's the only one who seems to have a cool head. You know, Mick is a disaster. He's crumbling. His wife is just, you know, trying to do the best she can. But Michelle is, is you know, she seems to have things under control. Uh, and so Gordon Ramsay says, Michelle's impressive. Michelle's impressive. She's the one person here who is in control. Sadly, she's now been left to face the fallout from her dad's incompetence. Sadly, she's now been left to face the fallout of her dad's incompetence. The fallout. This is basically the 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 the, the result of a of a bad thing. Like, you know, something happens and then all the bad things happen as a consequence. So the consequences or results of a, a bad thing, like a mistake. For example, you know, the UK is now experiencing the fallout of Brexit. You know, like since the you know the EU referendum, since the UK voted to leave the European Union, we've experienced a kind of fallout where there's been sort of chaos in Parliament, and you know uh, the the pound has dropped, and you know all these other problems. Uh, the fallout of the Brexit, uh, uh, the referendum result. Um, okay, and Michelle has been left to face the fallout. So the fallout of this is the fact that she's now got a restaurant full of unhappy customers who are waiting and waiting and waiting, and she's left to face the fallout. So she's got to actually, uh, you know, deal with this situation. And she goes around the restaurant, and we we can hear customers uh, talking about how they're not happy and how they're having to wait for a long time. Who is in control? Sadly, she's now been left to face the fallout from her dad's incompetence. Yeah, I've been waiting about an hour and a half, yeah. Too long, to be fair. I've lost count of the minutes and it's gone bit too long, really. We're hungry. Desperate. Those meals Mick did manage to get out of the kitchen are now being sent back. Check out the passive uh, voice in that one. Those meals that did... Those meals that Mick did manage to get sent out of the kitchen are now being sent back. The food is being sent back now, which means the customers are sending it back to the to the kitchen because it's not cooked properly or it doesn't taste good or something. We're hungry. Desperate. <laughs> Those meals Mick did manage to get out of the kitchen are now being sent back. We've got a phone there to communicate. Don't, Don't come down here and try and make a scene because you're on camera. Don't come down here and try and make a scene. If you make a scene, it means you cause like a big problem and it's like, you know, um, obviously a big problem. For example, a big argument and there's lots of noise and all the other people are like, oh, what's that? What's going on? Are they having an argument? Oh, look at this. Oh, my God, what's going on there? Oh, they're not happy, are they? Who are they? Do you know them? Oh, yeah, they're, I think they live on our street. It's like, don't make a big scene, darling. Don't make a big scene. Don't make a fuss. And so uh, here, Mick is saying... Don't come down here and make a scene because you're on camera. So he's saying to Michelle, don't come down here and, you know, argue with me and make a big scene uh, because you're on camera. So he's, you know, embarrassed. There to communicate. Don't, don't come down here and try and make a scene because you're on camera. Oh, you're the one doing it. Can you ask Gordon to shut the kitchen down, please? Because I refuse to. to work with my husband like this any longer. I refuse to work with my husband like this any longer. Right, I'll sort it out. I'm going to sort it out. I'm, I'm so sorry, but the bistro is closed. The bistro is closed now, apparently. And now we see Mick outside. He's lighting a cigarette. He's standing outside the restaurant because he can't handle it. And apparently he's suffering. He's like having major stress here. He's talk he talks to Gordon about how his heart is booming. Boom, boom, boom. His heart's booming like that. And he's like, I can't handle it. I don't want to have a heart attack. Which is ironic, considering he's smoking a cigarette. I tell you what, mate, I've, my heart's booming. I don't want to have a heart attack about this. Like, maybe it's best to stop smoking then, Mick. My husband's big fucking dream is a complete farce. My husband's big fucking dream is a complete farce. A farce is like a ridiculous comedy of errors, like a kind of play. A play in the theatre, a play where everything goes wrong and it's totally ridiculous, a farce. My husband's great fucking dream is a big fucking farce. Did she say fucking farce? I don't know. She might as well have done.
Far. Where's he gone? I don't know, Gordon. I don't fucking care. He's gone outside. Come on. I can't. I'm not going to fucking have a heart attack over this. I don't want you to My have a fucking heart attack. Fucking, uh, I don't want you to have a heart attack over this. My heart's fucking booming. I just don't want it. I'm his daughter and he speaks to me like shit, like mum, you know? I'm his daughter and he speaks to me like shit. To speak to someone like shit or to treat someone like shit. Here's another bit of... Let's let's say, inventive swearing, right? Here's another phrase with involving a swear word. To treat someone like shit or to speak to someone like shit. To, that means to treat someone badly or speak to someone badly. I'm his daughter and he speaks to me like shit. It's his wife. You know, and he thinks he does it because he thinks he gets away with it. He can't get away with it. He does it because he thinks he can get away with it. Another phrasal verb. To get away with it. That means you do something wrong and you don't get punished. For example, to get away with it, you know, like I, f I, I found this bag of money in the street, right? I think it belonged to this gangster who he was dead, right? I didn't do it, but I took the money, but it's all right because I think I got away with it. And then, doom, 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 police. Oh, God, we didn't get away with it. That's the police, for example, all right? to get away with it. He 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 speaks to me like shit and he speaks to my mum like shit and he does it because he thinks he can get away with it but he can't get away with it. He gets away with it. He can't get away with it. I can take the knocks. So I think like, I try to take all the knocks for everybody. I try and take the knocks for everybody. This is Mo and she's crying. She's saying, I try to take the knocks. So a knock is a bit like a hit, you know, like a... Like a, a like uh, like if you get hit, that's a knock. Uh, I try to take the knocks. The knocks means like the bad things that happen to you. Like the the failures or the just the bad stuff that happens. And maybe it's the moments when Mick gets angry and says something, you know. Uh, Mo is the one who takes the knocks. She's the one who takes the impact of, of the problems. So, you know, Mo is there trying to, you know, protect other members of her family. She's trying to protect Mick and she's trying to protect Michelle. Um, and she's the one who takes the knocks. And, you know, it's not fair on her, is it? And she's upset. I can take the knocks. So I think like, I'll try to take all the knocks for everybody. But even I've got a breaking point. Even I've got a breaking point. So a breaking point is the point at which you break. Even I've got a breaking point. So it sounds terrible. It's like breaking point for this family. Um, now, we're, we're, we're fast running out of time here, uh, but we're not all the way through this story. But I think I'm not going to do a part three of this. But I will just basically tell you how it worked out in the end. So, so um, essentially, um, the, you know, Gordon tried to uh, work on, on Mick and try to make him like face up to the problems that he had, like the financial problems, the issues with the food um, and so on, and and the issues with his communication with his family. He tried to, uh, Im, you know, improve all those things with Mick, but Mick was so stubborn and maybe in denial, meaning not willing to accept um, uh, the reality of the situation. For whatever reason, Mick just wasn't in a position to, to turn things around. And so in the end, um, Gordon decided that he would, change things and he, he put Mick in the front of house meaning Mick was uh, out in the restaurant serving at tables and and greeting customers and Michelle was in the kitchen because he thought Michelle's the only one who's got her head screwed on she's got her head screwed on you know uh, so let's put her in the kitchen and he also arranged for Michelle to have a little bit of formal training in another kitchen where she learned some 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 techniques she'd never cooked in the kitchen before but he put her in at the deep end right in the kitchen, and she did a much better job than Mick did. And it worked out for a while. But Mick was still the problem because, um, you know, Mick was, like, lazy and all this kind of thing. So the problems continued, and it, and it, and it was really a family issue. Um, and um, so they did start making... Uh, the, after putting Michelle in the kitchen, and after she kind of rose to the challenge... Um, that they reopened the place with new design, so they repainted it and got rid of the psychedelic wallpaper, uh, a new uh, a menu with fresh food, and it 
was a success. It was a success. It worked. And uh, the customers were much more happy. Everything seemed to work. Even though there were still some problems with Mick and his approach, generally speaking, it worked. So despite the fact that we we listened to a lot of uh, the family having problems and arguing and it all breaking down and and the, the tears and the, uh, the arguments and stuff, I think in the end it worked out okay after they they managed to solve their problems but you know that's often the way isn't it when you're sort of running a business or something that um you know there are often personal issues that cause the business to go wrong and if you're brave enough to face up to the those issues you can deal with them and move on and make it all more successful and um they changed the name of the restaurant they they changed it martin's bistro not uh um, not the Dovecoat Bistro, and it was more personalised and generally good. So check it out. Check out the video on the page for the episode on the page for this episode, and you'll see. There's also I found the whole episode, the entire episode, which is about an hour. Um, the whole thing I found it on YouTube with Korean subtitles. So if you're from Korea and you want to see that with Korean subtitles, so you understand all of it, then you can find that video on the page as well. And if you're not Korean, if you just want to see the whole episode with all the other bits that you missed, you can find it on the page for this episode too because I'm nice like that. So I certainly hope that you've picked up a lot more language from that uh, and that, um, you know, that you sort of enjoyed listening to, uh, you know, this family struggling to make their restaurant business uh, successful and that you enjoyed listening to Gordon Ramsay and his straight-talking approach. Okay, that's enough for this episode. Thanks very much for listening. Speak to you again on the podcast very, very, very soon. But for now, it's time to say goodbye. Bye, 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 bye.